consciousness means awareness, a clear understanding of something. And I would argue that today we don't have a clear understanding of what democracy means or could mean. And so my job is to try to expand your imagination beyond the status quo, beyond what we're familiar with. So what does democracy mean? For most of us today, it means electoral, um, it means elections and party competitions. It means voting every few years for people who are going to exercise power on our behalf. It means consenting to power. But if you zoom back, zoom away from this particular historical moment we are in, from the last 200 years or so, all the way back to ancient Greece, and specifically 5th and 4th century Athens, you found out that democracy meant something completely different, something that didn't involve elections or party competition. It meant exercising power. It meant gathering in the public space to deliberate about issues and vote on them. That was the assembly of the people that gathered in the Agora or the Pnics later on. It meant being uh, randomly selected, selected by lot, to participate in the Council of 500, an institution where ordinary citizens set the agenda for this assembly of the people. So back then, power was accessible, was open. And true, citizenship was exclusionary. It excluded women, it excluded slaves and foreigners. But once you counted as a citizen, you were in, so to speak. We are now told that this model is archaic, is dated, is not available to us, because we live in the age of mass commercial societies, and there are just too many of us, and we're just too busy pursuing commercial endeavors to spend so much time on politics. So we're told we have to live in representative democracies. But somehow this move to representation has also meant a move to exclusion and closure. The irony is that as we enfranchise more and more people, including women, including the poor, we also entrench the system in which power is inaccessible to most of us who don't have, say, enough money, enough of the right connections, the right accent, the right education, or just the right personality. Did it have to be that way? Well, consider this simple thought. What's the likelihood that we got the right institutional design on the first try in the 18th century? And so in this talk, I'd like to um, explore with you the roads not taken back then that we could explore today in the 21st century with all the knowledge and the technologies we have. So for that, let me take you first on a journey to Iceland. Iceland is a tiny nation in the middle of the northern Atlantic, population 320,000 people or so. As the joke goes, their football team is whoever is left wants to take out the women, the children, the old, the fishermen, and whoever is out of the country traveling. But things are very interesting in Iceland. For one thing, when you want to overthrow a government, what you do is you bang kitchenware literally pots and pans, in front of parliament. You throw some fruit and yogurt at the walls for good measure, and politicians resign. They just give up, too much noise. So in 2008, when the financial crisis hit their country and burned seven times their GDP, that's what they did. It was called the pots and pans revolution. They got a new government, and this new government delivered on uh, one of the claims of the, of the people who did the revolution, they wanted a new constitution to replace the 1944 one that was considered archaic and dated. And there again, they did things very interestingly. How do, you, what, how do you think they organized this constitutional process? First, they started with a national forum of 950 randomly, uh, quasi-randomly selected ordinary citizens that they tasked with uh, 
coming up with the principles and values that they wanted to see embedded in this new social contract. So they gathered physically and talked about the values they wanted to see embedded in their um, new constitution. Among other things, they came up with the idea of a collective ownership of natural resources, a right to information, um, a citizen's initiative, that is the right for a sufficient number of people to put a law to parliament, and all sorts of other uh, ideas, including, for example, the restructuring the constitution. The current constitution um, has uh, the president's rights listed first and the people's rights listed last. They said, we want the opposite order, the people's rights first, president's rights last. So then who do you think they chose to write this new constitution? They said, no politicians. So by law, they excluded all the professional politicians. Then they said, who wants to write it? 523 people raised their hands and ran for election. 25 were elected. Those 25 included 10 women, a farmer, a union representative, a student, a pastor, a couple of academics as well, a political scientist, an economist, two mathematicians, but no constitutional scholar. And here's the assembly. On the front row, you see Freya Harald's daughter, who's a human rights activist and also um, severely disabled. So a pretty unusual constitutional process so far. It got even more unusual when these 25 decided to consult the larger public on the internet. They said, we're not going to write this behind closed doors. We're going to consult other people. So they put their draft on the internet, 12 of them, and got feedback. Feedback, again, about the structure. Feedback about the content. Among the proposals that came from the public were, for example, a right to the internet which was post posted on Facebook as a suggestion just at the time when uh, Mubarak in Egypt was turning, uh, turning off the internet in uh, response to what's now known as the Arab Spring. They also got ideas for um, transgender rights and children's rights. Ultimately, about 10% of the suggestions made a causal difference to um, text. So again, very unusual um, process overall. If you compare it back to the Philadelphia Convention, where 55 bewigged uh, men from the higher socioeconomic classes, some of them slave owners, wrote a new social contract for America behind closed doors. Or even if you compare it to more recent such processes like the processes that led to the European Constitution and treatises. So why am I telling you this story? I'm telling you this story because my experience studying the Icelandic process taught me that we could envision a different way of doing democracy. And that if Icelanders can do this for something that is seemingly as technical as writing a constitution, Surely, other countries can do this as well, and they can do it also for ordinary law. So now I want to talk to you about what I call open democracy, which is a paradigm that is distinct from what we are used to and know as representative democracy. I don't offer it to you as an institutional blueprint, but as um, a lens, uh, a set of institutional principles that should guide institutional design. And I think those principles are not um, currently implemented in any of our democracies as a set. So the first one is what I call empowerment rights. Empowerment rights are rights that are meant to cut open a path from the periphery to the center of power so that ordinary citizens can access agenda setting, deliberation, and all the steps that are included in a political process. They go beyond liberal rights, such as freedom of speech, freedom of association, etc. They encompass them as well. But liberal rights are usually um, were, were conceived as checks on power, protections against power. This is about empowerment. 
So among those empowerment rights, I include as well the right to take part in uh, mini publics, the right to be selected uh, by, by lot for a mini public. I also include citizens initiatives, the right to, for a, a sufficiently large number of um, uh, citizens to put a law to parliament and get that proposal at least debated, a right of referral, which is the possibility for a sufficiently large number of citizens to organize a referendum on a law that's considered impopular or dysfunctional. And finally, I include rights that would empower vulnerable minorities or um, historically disenfranchised groups like indi indigenous people. The second principle is democratic deliberation. Democratic deliberation is an idea at the center of uh, a paradigm developed over the last 40 years by philosophers called deliberative democracy. Um, you may have heard of Jürgen Habermas, who uh, is one of the um, main philosophers in, in this paradigm. And the idea is that laws and policies are only legitimate to the extent that they've been debated by free and equal citizens. But the systems we live in do not facilitate this kind of deliberation. Because they are based on parties and, and demand partisanship on our part, they pit us against each other and limit the amount of um, actual exchange that occurs between parties across ideological divides and lines. And so I, so I think we could do better. We could um, design systems that enhance deliberation, facilitate it, um, are, are built around it. The third principle is the majoritarian principle. The majoritarian principle is the idea that when deliberation fails to produce a consensus, as it will often, we need still to reach a decision. And the default rule should be to go with roughly the majority. This can come in many forms. Simple majority rule is the one we're most familiar with. Another one would be so-called majority judgment, which consists in aggregating people's ratings about uh, a policy or a candidate. We would give five star or three stars or one star and take the average. Some of you might worry, oh, isn't that introducing the danger of the tyranny of the majority that Tocqueville has warned uh, us about? But I think this worry about the tyranny of the majority has paralyzed our current system. We've been so concerned about it that we've basically gone the, other, the opposite way and empowered powerful minori minorities as opposed to protected vulnerable ones. So I think we could afford to go in the direction of greater majoritarianism without risking the danger of tyrannical majority or populism. The fourth principle is what I call complex representation. This is where open democracy differs more subtly from representative democracy because it also embraces the idea that we need representatives. We need to delegate authority. We can't be um, exercising power all the time. But it denies that elections are the only way to select for representatives, and instead embraces a rich ecology of forms of democratic representation. So here, let me give you an example. The, the main um, form of representation that I'm interested in uh, and find particularly um, appealing is what I call lotocratic representation. Representation by citizens that are selected by lot or randomly selected. This has virtues that are not connected to the sort of accountability you get through elections, but are nonetheless democratic. It's about equality. It's about maximizing the diversity and the descriptive representativeness of our assemblies so that they tap the collective wisdom distributed among all of us. It's about impartiality. It's about um, fighting corruption as well. And there are already examples of these lotocratic mini-publics all over the world have been experimented with in different formats, including citizens' assemblies in Canada, including deliberative polls. Uh, Jim Fishkin has been organizing them all over the world. National forums, citizens' juries, etc., etc. And they work, so we just need to experiment more, more with them. Another form of uh, democratic representation that is non-electoral is what I call crowdsource representation. It's a kind of citizen representation that occurs when the Icelanders went online on this crowdsourcing platform and offered comments and suggestions and engaged in a deliberation with the constituent writers. It's arguably the kind of um, 
representation that occurs when the 6,000 citizens who could make it to the People's Assembly in ancient Greece spoke and made de decisions on behalf of the 30,000 that really were uh, defining the demos back then. Finally, we could also revisit electoral representation, perhaps um, tweaking it to fix some of its most um, egregious problems. And I know Brian Ford is going to tell you about this. I'm going to tell you about delegative or liquid democracy, where we would have so much more choice in terms of who our representatives can be and who we can transfer our votes to. So these are a few of the kind of democratic representation that we could use as alternatives to electoral representation. There are two more principles, rotation and transparency, which I see as more instrumental to the functionality of the system as a whole. They are meant to create um, accountability elements that we wouldn't necessarily get if we don't have elections. Rotation embodies the known principle that um, power corrupts and that we need to make power circulate, not let it stagnate with the same people for too long. For example, in the US, the turnover for congressmen is 10%. People stay in a lifetime in politics. This has implications that I, I don't think are all good. And yes, there will be a trade-off in terms of professionalism and expertise, but I think it's a trade-off that we should be willing to consider if we believe in democracy, because ultimately, democracy is the rule of the amateurs. It's letting ordinary citizens have the first and the last say. And enroll experts, certainly. Experts have a great role to play in this system, but at the sidelines, as informants, not decision makers. Transparency, finally, my sixth principle, is the idea that light is the best disinfectant that if we want people to behave, we need to put them in the spotlight. We need to be able to watch and observe what they're doing. The way the 25 uh, constitution makers in Iceland opened up the process to the larger public and made it as transparent as possible that way. Again, there will be trade-offs, and I'm not saying that everything should be like a you know, general panopticon all the time, but surely as a default rule, this is a sound one. So you might ask, okay, so what would a democracy that was built after these six principles look like? I don't have an answer. I cannot give you the definitive blueprint for this. But I think it would be centered around what I call the open mini-public. That, that would be the central leitmotif of this new democracy as opposed to an elected assembly. It would be a body of a few hundred randomly selected citizens that would either set the agenda for another assembly, perhaps an elected one, or make the law themselves, if they turn out to be capable of doing that. And they would be connected to the larger public through crowdsourcing and deliberative platforms. They would be connected to other mini-publics, taking care of perhaps single issues or other functions, and all the while embedded in a system where referenda are made frequent so that the larger public can ultimately have a say on very salient issues or um, uh, uh, important ones. So again, I want to emphasize that what I just laid out for you is not um, a definitive blueprint. I offer it to you as a lens through which to look at the democratic deficits of our existing systems and observe, be able to see the potential for new institutions. Would there be parties in this new form of democracy? Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe they would be, uh, uh, there would be parties, but their members would be sent at random to power so that the hierarchies would have an incentive to educate all of their members equally. There might not be elections. There might be forms uh, an institution that I cannot conceive of. But basically, I'm giving you a, a lens through which to try to see more of, of the, the space of possibilities 
and, um, and I'm encouraging you to exploit with me. Thank you. Gracias.